All right, everybody. I think that we are just about ready to get started with our afternoon session. So welcome to anybody that is just now joining us. We had a really great conversation this morning and we're really looking forward to the afternoon. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Professor Rabel, who will introduce our fourth panel and the moderator. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're about to have a very important panel discussion, and I really appreciate all the judges and lawyers that are going to be part of this next panel, which is a little bit longer than the ones this morning because the subject matter calls for it. Let me in introduce the our moderator, and then she'll introduce the rest of the, the panel. And uh, so, Seema, if you can appear on the screen, that would be great. Uh, Seema Safi is an academic fellow at the Quatrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Now, she only started that a few months ago, and uh, I was able to grab her to be our moderator for this and write an article for the symposium issue on this topic. I, I met Seema over the years because she was an Innocence Project attorney for a long time and actually handled some cases in North Carolina, but of course we interact at the uh, annual conferences, which we haven't had now, of course, in a couple of years. We hope to regather again next year. So she was a staff attorney there, did some work with the uh, ACLU in Pennsylvania and challenged civil liberties abuses in cases involving racial justice and national security, and was also a litigation associate at a New York law firm working on federal habeas uh, challenging the indefinite detention of men imprisoned without charge um, in Guantanamo Bay. So Seema, thank you so much for organizing this panel and, and leading it. And I'm going to turn it over to you, if that's all right, to uh, introduce the folks and they, as, as you call them, as you call them out, uh, if each panelist would go ahead and turn on your video and, um, and your microphone because this is going to be an all panel discussion. Thank you so much, Seema. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you to everyone for joining us for this very important conversation on secondary trauma and race. So we have an all star lineup of lawyers and judges doing incredible and tireless work in the criminal justice system. And I will get right into introducing them. And just to reiterate what Mark said, um, feel free to keep your audios on mute, but uh, when you are introduced, if you could please turn on your video, that would be great. So we are delighted to be joined first by Judge Gregory Weeks. Judge Weeks served as a Superior Court Judge in Cumberland County for almost 25 years, and also served as Senior Resident Superior Court Judge until his retirement in 2012. Earlier in his career, Judge Weeks worked for a decade as an assistant public defender, also in Cumberland County. Judge Weeks has served on the board of directors of the Sentencing Project and the North Carolina Justice Center, and he previously served as chairman of the North Carolina Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities. In 2012, in a series of landmark decisions, Judge Weeks issued the first and only rulings under North Carolina's historic Racial Justice Act, vacating the death sentences of four men after finding that prosecutors had engaged in intentional and systemic discrimination against African Americans in jury selection at the county level and throughout the state. Judge Weeks is the recipient of the North Carolina Advocates for Justice Outstanding Trial Judge Award and the North Carolina Academy of Trial Lawyers Outstanding Trial Judge Award. He is also the recipient of the Frank Porter Graham Award for Lifetime Achievement in Civil Liberties. Welcome Judge Weeks. Next, we have Henderson Hill. Henderson is senior counsel at the American Civil Liberties Union Capital Punishment Project. Henderson began his career with the Public Defender Service of Washington, DC, where he remained for 10 years, and he has spent his legal career in indigent and capital defense and civil rights work. Henderson founded and directed the Center for Death Penalty Litigation in North Carolina. He then spent over a decade as a partner at the civil rights law firm Ferguson Stein Chambers and was the executive director of the Federal Defenders of Western North Carolina. He is the founder, first executive director and director emeritus of the Eighth Amendment Project. Henderson also launched and continues to serve as co-director of Redress North Carolina, an initiative aimed at addressing mass incarceration in the state. In 2007, Henderson was inducted as a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. 
He also won the Center for Death Penalty Litigation's Kirk Osborne Award for Leadership in Capital Defense. In the summer of 2020, Henderson was appointed by Governor Roy Cooper to serve as a member of the North Carolina Task Force for Racial Equity and Criminal Justice. Welcome, Henderson. We are also delighted to be joined by Judge Karen E.D. Williams. Judge E.D. Williams is a Superior Court judge in Mecklenburg County. She was appointed by Governor Cooper in 2017 and elected to another term in 2018. Judge E.D. Williams was previously a district court judge where she served for seven years after being appointed by Governor Beth Perdue. Judge E.D. Williams began her legal career as an assistant public defender in Charlotte. We see a pattern here. She then worked for seven years as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Western District of North Carolina, where she prosecuted white collar crimes and served as financial crimes litigation unit supervisor in the U.S. Attorney's Office Civil Division. And she received several awards as an AUSA. Prior to her judicial appointments, Judge E.D. Williams also worked as a vice president and assistant general counsel for Wachovia Corporation. Judge E.D. Williams is a former vice president of the Mecklenburg County Bar, and she was appointed by the North Carolina State Bar President to serve two terms on the State Bar Disciplinary Hearings Commission, where she presided over numerous ethics trials for North Carolina lawyers who are at risk of suspension or disbarment. Welcome, Judge E.D. Williams. Next, we have Satana DeBerry. Satana DeBerry is the newly elected district attorney of Durham County, where she took office in 2019. Prior to her election, Satana spent her career working on behalf of poor people in housing, consumer finance, and community economic development. Before she took office as district attorney, Satana was the executive director of the North Carolina Housing Coalition, where she worked on issues of affordable housing, and she was senior vice president of policy and programs for the North Carolina Community Development Initiative. Satana previously was general counsel for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Earlier in her career, Satana was a criminal defense attorney and also led the foreclosure prevention project at Durham Self-Help Credit Union. Satana has previously served on the board and as interim executive director of Durham Habitat for Humanity. Welcome District Attorney DeBerry. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Christina Swarns. Christina is the executive director of the Innocence Project. She previously served as the president and attorney in charge of the Office of the Appellate Defender, one of New York City's oldest institutional providers of indigent appellate defense. Christina spent over a decade at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, where she served as LDF's litigation director and criminal justice project director. Christina previously was a federal defender in the Capitol Habeas Unit of Philadelphia's Community Defender Office and a criminal defense attorney at the Legal Aid Society in New York City. In 2016, Christina argued before the US Supreme Court and won Buck versus Davis, a challenge to the introduction of explicit racially biased evidence in a Texas death penalty case. She is one of the few black women ever to have argued before the US Supreme Court. Christina is the recipient of the Norman Redlick Capital Defense Distinguished Service Award from the New York City Bar Association's Capital Punishment Committee. She was also selected by the University of Pennsylvania Law School's faculty to be an honorary fellow in residence, an honor given to an attorney who makes significant contributions to the ends of justice at the cost of great personal risk and sacrifice. And I thought that was an appropriate sentence on which to end the introductions. So, just to situate ourselves among all the other panels that occurred this morning, the ways in which race and trauma intersect in the legal system have too often been ignored by the law and by the legal profession. Lawyers of color have borne witness to this intersection from individual microaggressions in the workplace to the structural racism that pervades our institutions, including our criminal justice institutions where the intersection between race and trauma is perhaps nowhere more acute. In just the last few years, this intersection has received heightened national attention. We have witnessed the historic formation of the movement for black lives. We have witnessed an endless number of police killings of unarmed black men and women and the accompanying violent police response to peaceful protests supporting black lives. We have witnessed stark disparities in just last month's Capitol siege, which as we speak is being replayed in this week's impeachment hearings. 
and we have witnessed an extraordinarily disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on illness and death among people of color, all of which have had traumatic consequences on people of color and have increased local, state, and national focus to issues of racial injustice, but not enough focus. In earlier panels today, we heard compelling personal accounts about the effects of secondary trauma in the profession. In this panel, we will continue that discussion, but with a more specific focus on race and the criminal justice system. So let's dive right in with the first question for this fantastic group. The United States incarcerates more people in absolute numbers and per capita than any other nation in the world. African Americans are disproportionately overrepresented as defendants in the criminal justice system. African American communities are in turn disproportionately affected by trauma in the criminal justice system. Part of addressing why our institutions are the way they are and why trauma is intergenerational involves understanding the legacy of racism in this country and the historic nature of our institutions. I want to start by asking the panel, how do the traumatic experiences that people of color have endured, particularly African Americans, how does that trauma manifest in the criminal justice system? And how does that trauma reproduce the inequality we see in the system? And it's a question for the group, for anyone who wants to begin. I'm happy to, to, to start out, uh, Seema. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation to participate in the panel. I wanna thank Wake Forest and Mark Grable. This is um, a wonderful and really, really important and timely conversation. So. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna just tell quickly uh, one story of one case that I litigated that I think speaks to the question of how um, the historic racial terror in this country continues to impact like contemporary functioning of the criminal legal system. Uh, when I was at LDF, we litigated, I represented someone on death row in Arkansas. Um, and uh, when we were, um, you know, investigating the case and preparing the petition, we spent a lot of time in the in the county uh, where this case took place, and 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 part of our job was, to, of course, to understand sort of the community dynamics as well as our clients' individual uh, history. And what we learned pretty quickly, and what we heard from from African American, you know, uh, prominent African Americans of the communities, judges, lawyers, uh, over and over again was that uh, black people in this town uh, didn't like going into the courthouse. They didn't like, um, you know, were not uh, either invited to and to the extent they were invited to serve, they didn't wanna serve, but largely there was this sort of this recurring theme of how black folks in this community uh, were, un were afraid, were, were unwilling to interact with the criminal legal system. Um, and so we sort of pushed it. We thought, you know, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, people, nobody wants to be a witness. Nobody wants to obviously be arrested. No one wants to go through the system. And so, you know, we were, you know, sort of just trying to understand what this was about. We kept pushing and they said, no, no, we're not, we're not talking about that. That's obvious, right? But uh, folks are concerned here about going to the courthouse to get a marriage license. Folks are concerned here about going um, to the courthouse to register a deed, like to do, you know, the, the routine things of, of interacting with the courthouse. And this was a fact that just puzzled us, um, you know, for a while. And it started us sort of digging into the history of this particular town and this particular county. And what we ultimately learned um, over time was that uh, this particular county had um, a mass lynching um, at, in the turn of the century, um, at 20, 20, 25 men, women, and children were lynched in one night. Um, you fast forward over the next, you know, 50 years, we learned that there was another, you know, eight to 10 uh, people lynched in, in this county. And then more specifically, there were two gentlemen who were lynched in one night where um, at, the, at the courthouse, at the very courthouse in which in the lamppost in front of the courthouse, in which people were now today, you know, expressing concern about interacting with. Um, and so, you know, we ultimately had the first elected, the first black prosecutor in the county, you know, testify sort of to this fact. And he went on the record and this uh, post-conviction hearing and he said, you know, to no objection from two uh, assistant state attorneys uh, who are sitting to my right, that the understanding in that community was that the courthouse, and I'm quoting him, 
was not a safe place for a black man to be. And that was for a trial, a capital trial in the 90s. And as it turned out, after he testi testified, people in the audience came to our defense table and said, thank you so much for sharing the story of what it's like in this community because it's the same way today. So that's just one specific example of right, how the history of racial terror in this country continues to operate right, in the way that that case was tried. right. So our client ultimately, of course, was tried uh, by a jury that was overwhelmingly white, even though the county, you know, the city and the county had a disproportionate number of black people. right. And there was two dynamics going on right, where people, black people were afraid to interact with the system. And then there was a separate process of the system excluding them. But that's just one example of sort of the trauma of the history of racial terror and violence in this country operating in a way that is literally disrupting the functioning of the system today. And I do want to piggyback on a little bit as to what Ms. Swarms has stated as to how trauma is manifesting itself in the criminal justice system. What I'm seeing as a judge what I've seen over the course of years is the issue of trust or distrust of the judicial system because of all the trauma over the past years. So despite the fact that I sit in a position of neutrality, I often find that criminal defendants who appear in front of me um, all but express that they don't trust me because I work for the system, regardless of the fact that I'm not an advocate, I'm not prosecution, I'm not defense, I sit in the middle it's hard to help someone understand that despite their lived experiences, I'm gonna to listen to them. And so they don't trust me from the men they walk in the room, regardless of who's sitting there, it's just the fact that I'm part of this system. Um, some would believe that because of my race and because of the fact that a lot of the criminal defendants who appear here in Mecklenburg look like me, some would assume rightly or wrongly, mostly wrongly in my opinion, that there may be some um, automatic feeling of trust or security in the courts when they see a black judge, but that's not always the case because those scars are still there from the past and they come in with all of that. We don't see it, you know, wear it on your shoulder, but it's there. And so we experience that a lot is the issue of trust and how do you overcome that? You can't build a rapport with someone in a matter of five to 10 minutes of that encounter. The most you can do is try to help them understand that you are there to listen and to hear them out and to give them a fair day in court or however long the trial may last. And so that's one of the obstacles that I face is trauma manifests itself as an issue of trust or distrust in the court system, no matter which seat you're sitting in, just by virtue of the history. Yeah, Judge Williams, A.D. Williams makes a, uh, a very good point. Um, you know, I am the elected prosecutor in a jurisdiction in which the senior resident superior court judge is black, the senior district court judge is black, most of our district court bench is black, um, our chief public defender is black, our sheriff is black, the chief of police is black, on and on and on and on. You know, we have a historically black college and university uh, right within a mile of downtown. Uh, Durham is a uh, quote unquote black city. And just to give you, uh, you know, Christina talked really about these issues of racial terror that we hear about, uh, these big issues, right? Lynchings in the public square. Um, I think what Judge Edie Williams is talking about and what I experience every day is just the mundanity of um, <clears throat> how racism has seeped into the system. So even in a jurisdiction like mine, where all of the people in power who are making the decisions essentially are black people and all of them individually, if you talk to each of them individually, would tell you that they are, they have themselves been a victim of racism, that they are themselves uh, warriors for racial justice, that they see uh, the ways in which systemic racism consistently acts in the criminal legal system. Um, we still get the same outcomes, right? And so uh, that is a tension that I think is uh, is hard to resolve, uh, certainly for me. Let, let me go back uh, and give a different, but also historical perspective. Um, 
I came to Fayetteville, North Carolina in 1977. And as Selma has indicated, I was a public defender for 10 years. Saw it from the per perspective of an advocate. Uh, in the early mid eighties, a lawsuit was filed in North Carolina. Uh, at that time, judges who ran for superior court seats had to run statewide. Uh, a lawsuit was filed uh, initially by Republicans. I think their contention was that uh, that method of selecting or electing Superior Court judges diluted Republic, uh, re Republican voting strength. Uh, North Carolina Association of Black Lawyers joined that lawsuit. Uh, at that time, if I recall correctly, I think the only African-American who had been elected under that scheme was Cliff Johnson out of Charlotte. Uh, as the lawsuit wound its way through uh, the federal court system, negotiations were ongoing and an agreement was reached by the then democratically controlled legislature uh, that eight new seats would be created. One of those seats was created here in Cumberland County. Uh, we had to run statewide, but uh, the only opposition could come from your district and the expectation, in fact, there was a lot of effort to bring in folks into the district to run, uh, to maintain status quo. So I had uh, gone from a, a perspective of a advocate, criminal defense lawyer, uh, representing defendants ranging all the way up from misdemeanors at the outset through capital litigation to uh, all of a sudden being a judge. Uh, and uh, it was unique in many respects uh, as we traveled around uh, our state, because our scheme provides that typically you're home for six months and you're on the road, normally within your division for 12 to 18 months, but you're subject to assignment anywhere in the state. And uh, it was interesting to arrive at a courthouse in not just our more rural districts, but in some of the uh, larger districts where you would go through where court personnel would go through and you'd be stopped by a bailiff saying you can't come through here. You would have your robe on your arm and your book bag because we didn't have computers back in those days. But when you actually took the bench and looked out on that audience, uh, you could sense, because typically you were looking at um, folks of color who were there for criminal sessions. Uh, a mixed response, some expectation that there's somebody who looks like me sitting in that seat. And I think initially, at least the uh, perception that I had, there was an expectation, there was a hope that had not existed before. And now I'm hearing folks who are talking about more recent events saying perhaps that hope is diminished to some degree that the expectation has gone somewhat back to that's part of the system. And I think frankly, as I look across the faces of the folks on this panel, all of us at one point or another have had to uh, uh, come to that come to Jesus moment in terms of how we respond to that. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do because you have your responsibilities as a judge, but at the same time, you've got your life experience that tells you that if there's going to be fairness in this process, you have to be one of the catalyst to bring about that fairness. And that's something I hope we can talk about as we go through forward this afternoon with this conversation. I, for one, would join my confession to Judge Weeks' uh, uh, suggestion that we all share in this, uh, in this tension. As Satana referred to, this is real tension. I mean, as individual professions, professionals, you know, we throw our whole soul into the work we do. And um, we're proud of the results, uh, we're, we're proud of our efforts, we're proud of the teams that we work with. Uh, but then we walk away and look at a system that is every bit as racist and unfair as it was when we started this work. And for me, that's almost 40 years ago. 
And so the tension that comes with thinking, well, you know, you've put this energy uh, into the work and the system has changed so very little. I think what has been really positive and impactful about the last few years is the addition to uh, the intellectual discourse, the work of Brian Stevenson, of Michelle Alexander, of, uh, of uh, Susan Herman. There's just a lot of people that have contributed to the notion that you know, we, we are so far beyond the, uh, the, uh, the tweaking of a system uh, to the point that we need transformation. Yeah, and I think a lot of the discourse has suggested that policing, which started as an institution uh, to control runaway slaves, uh, you know, we, we've moved from that, but many of the traditions and the culture of that institution you know, still draw from that legacy. And we, when we talk about the conversion away from lynching, my goodness, what Christina shared, <laughs> It still stops you in the tracks, but the modern death penalty draws so directly from that legacy. And what we know from, uh, from even the Supreme Court decisions is that the modern death penalty grew out of the need to replace that lynching system. So uh, I, take, uh, I take some comfort that the Wake Forest University Law School has, has instituted this symposium. I take some comfort from the fact that a Southern governor in North Carolina instituted a task force uh, on racial equity in the criminal justice system. And in that task force, uh, we had other people who are not your usual customers, not your usual consumers of the work that we do every day. And it was healthy and good to see their eyes open when you talk about mass incarceration as a set of statistics, it's one thing. But then when you hear the stories of a 17 year old black woman who appears in court for the first time, no criminal history, the low person on the totem pole of a small drug crew. When she appears uh, at, for sentencing two years later, she's the mother of an infant. The three male co-defendants, uh, they get less than three years, she gets over 20 ripped from her arms it, it, it is literally an infant. And so when we talk about trauma yeah, and racial terrorism, uh, there's the role of police shootings, there's the role of the death penalty, but what about that separation of a single parent mother and an infant to serve decades in prison? Uh, and, and I think when people move away from the just sort of the raw statistics to see and to put faces on, on what mass incarceration means, uh, we can make progress as a community. And that's why I think uh, these task force forces are important. I think a symposium like this is important. I think lawyers in particular have a very special role in leading and educating our communities about these fundamental truths. And I take some comfort from this summer's uh, national reckoning on race uh, that we're making some progress. I, I, I take some hope, hope against hope, that the insurrection will have some educational value, the impeachment stuff will have some educational value, and we will continue to uh, engage in this moral reckoning. So let's uh, discuss that tension. I mean, there's a number of different threads I'm hearing here, and I want to go back to one that uh, started with Christina, and and I think all of you have uh, talked about this idea of disengagement. And you know, I'm going back to this paper that I read that um, uh, many of you have probably read. It's by Monica Bell, and it's about legal estrangement and and this theory of um, the relationship between African Americans and policing. And she talks about it in a different way. She said that, you know, people have started to develop this theory of procedural justice, but she wants to look at it as a, as a theory of legal estrangement and the way that um, communities are just feeling estranged from law enforcement for a whole number of reasons. And when you have referred to this idea of the long-term effects of racial terror, 
people not feeling safe, people feeling disengaged. How do you how do you wrestle with that disengagement when it is we have seen just this year how engagement from communities of color is vital to protecting our freedoms? Like a new president was installed because of a robust turnout of particularly black voters. High black voter turnout in Georgia's runoff elections determined control of our Senate. And so that political power, which was led largely by grassroots efforts, largely by black women to mobilize voters, it was the culmination of increased activism as well as increased pain. And so when people disengage because of this feeling that the system is unfair, their voices aren't heard because of this distrust that Judge Edie Williams mentioned, and you've seen that disengagement, whether individually or community-wide, how do you how do you begin to wrestle with that disengagement when the very people who are traumatized the most are also the most vital to protecting all of our freedoms? Yeah, you recognize that it, it doesn't happen by itself. Uh, yeah, Georgia didn't happen by itself. The turnout in Arizona didn't happen uh, by itself. Uh, you realize that the policies of folks who, who look to suppress the vote, you know, the big lies, uh, big lies by people in power, you know, that has a real impact on folks. I mean, I, I recall in the small part of the world that I try to influence uh, in these campaigns, you know, you're making call, you're trying to turn out the vote, and there's a sense of helplessness uh, of, uh, that is, it's futile. It's just complete futility. Uh, it, it's sort of a, the opposite end of that, you know, the system is rigged, uh, you know, the vote is stolen. You know, folks in, in, in oppressed communities look at people of power and, and their powerlessness every day. Uh, and it, it's hard to sustain uh, political agendas. And that's why I think it takes sustained work. Uh, by community leaders, and I think all of us are in, in every sense community leaders. I think lawyers are, uh, by virtue of profession, community leaders. I mean, it takes us to be engaged in our communities to, to demonstrate that, uh, that Georgia and Arizona can happen, and it can only happen with sustained uh, community empowerment, community drives. Uh, yeah, so I think that's one of the weights that we carry. I mean, we feel the same frustration as our fellows in the community, but we know from history, we know um, that we've got to overcome and resist. We know from our heroes in the past that we can't give up and give out. And so we've got to continue to inspire and to mobilize our, our communities. But you know, we need to keep sustaining ourselves in this drive. And uh, I, I, I'm sort of pleased to be surrounded by colleagues that I can take inspiration from. Yeah, and I want to challenge a little bit the even the framing of that question um, that Black people in communities of color are kind of disengaged from the power structure. I feel like we're we're always looking outward at what can Black people do more of, what can communities of color do more of when we are the ones who are consistently in this battle, like every day, you know, let's take, for example, um, this rise in gun violence uh, across the United States. There's been lots of conversation about that. And what are black people doing about that? There are hundreds, if not thousands, hundreds of thousands of black people every day engaged in saving black lives in their communities. Um, black women have the highest voter turnout of, any group in this country, you know, we're still in the battle. Uh, kind of like what Henderson says, when you, as a black lawyer, you know, I don't know how many, I don't know there are many of us who are in it for the money, even those of us who are making money, right? Um, I don't care if you're going to work in the corporate offices of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase every day as a black person, right? You are still engaging in the struggle and you're still moving forward um, racial justice in what you do. 
And so I think we have to think of ourselves really as doing yeoman's work. Like we are holding up, uh, Judge Weeks said something that was really impactful to me when he says to the extent that there's fairness, we are it, right? Just our mere presence in a place um, requires people to look at that place differently. Uh, and, and, you know, I think all of us take that seriously. I don't think any of us, when we, um, you know, we took that oath when we raised our hand, when we decided to go to law school, you know, we didn't say, man, I can't, you know, wait for those bucks to, to dry, come in. You know, I'm a Gen Xer. What it meant for me was that, you know, I saw people like Thurgood Marshall and Barbara Jordan. And I said, oh, my God, like, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Right. So that's why I do what I do. Um, and so we, you know, we're constantly working. So I think to call us this, to say we are disengaged is to um, kind of undercut the work that we do every day. Let, let me share this with you. Um, I, I presided over the Racial Justice Act cases, which dealt with the um, historic exclusion of African-Americans from uh, capital juries. It was across the board, but it was in the specific context of capital juries. It's easy to say that um, we're not, as a community, participating to the level that we can. But that ignores the fact that uh, there, there's some reasons for that. We're talking about systemic, structural, and institutional racism that, first of all, limits the number of African Americans who end up in a pool. And then we're talking about economic disparities that make it difficult for a person who's making minimum wage or who may be a single parent to serve on cases uh, that uh, are uh, on a variety of levels costly to them. Uh, and then we're dealing with the jury selection process where the system comes into play. Uh, one of the things that I did as a trial lawyer when I was involved in trying cases, including capital cases, was I recognized up front there were only gonna be a handful of African-Americans in that jury pool. And when the judge said those words call for the jury, I was going to turn around and I was going to make eye contact with every African-American juror coming into that courtroom. And my eyes were going to say to their eyes, you may not know exactly what's going to come on, but watch as it plays out. And when the prosecutor in the case was examining juror number one, juror number two, who were white folks, and then got to juror number three and reached over to the uh, uh, law enforcement officer and got a piece of paper, the communication was, that's a rap sheet that's being provided that they pulled in advance with the expectation that it applies to you. So you have means of communicating the same we, means we use every day in our lives that apply in the courtroom as well. But it also involves a responsibility on our part to go out it's frustrating, it's disappointing, but we have an obligation to educate. And when our folks in our community understand all of the barriers that are out there and how important that a process is, folks, I spent probably six, seven weeks in the RJA hearings. And there were days when I would look out at the audience and the only folks of color were me, the defendants, and one of the belts. Now, this had to do with issues of life and death. But for all of the reasons that we're talking about, which are complex and multifaceted, we still have that additional obligation of when we're not in the courtroom, when we're not on the bench, going out into the community and doing our part, because our folks, just like everybody else, has been exposed to his story, not history. And educating them exactly why we are where we are based on the history of this country. Oops. So I would just add, I think that there's a really important uh, component of, I think pe pe people reacted over the summer and people reacted over the last, um, whatever, several years of the Black Lives Matter um, emergence. I think in part because 
for the first time in a long time, we were calling it what it is, right? Um, right. We had spent, all of us that are on in this panel have been working in the system for, you know, decades and have seen the, you know, I, there's not, I have never been in a courtroom in any part of the country where it doesn't look exactly the same. Rural, uh, urban, north, south, it doesn't matter where you are, right? Every courtroom I have ever been in, it's a sea of black people and brown people being prosecuted and the other side of the bent, you know, of the, of the bar is overwhelmingly white. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter if it's in a place that is um, disproportionately white, the, literally the, the courthouse population will be the same. It's never different. And, um, you know, and we have all in this, on this, in this conversation, you know, seen injustices and we've heard them characterized as this is a bad apple and this is just a rogue such and such and this is a bad defense lawyer and this is a bad prosecutor and this is a bad judge. Um, but I think what captivated people was we were calling what was happening what it is, right? Which is what Judge Weeks just said, right? This is a systemic problem. It is a structural problem. And I think that, you know, there is something about, and I think Henderson flagged this, right? That, or um, maybe not Henderson, right? There is something about the mundaneness of the court process, right? If you're in there every day and people are just coming in, you know, you can, it, it's sort of numbing, right? The, the shock of, of the disparity of the stark, overwhelming, shocking disparity can, you know, it becomes normalized in a way that frankly, uh, you know, reifies, right? And reinforces the idea that the people that should be going through the system are the people that are, you know, that are in the system, right? These people are in the system because they're the bad people. Um, but that's not true, right? And if you, if you step back from that, right? And you call and you name, right? That there is something wrong here, right? That people's lives are not being treated or valued equally. And the system is not functioning and treating equal, you know, people equally, right? Then, I mean, there's just really something important about all of us stopping, right? All of us that work in the system, and certainly I don't mean just Black people, but all of us that work in the system, right? It's incumbent upon us to name what is happening and name what we see um, because it's real and it's not, you know, it, it's not a figment of the community's imagination, right? The community feels um, disengaged in part by the failure of acknowledgement of the reality that they have endured for centuries. Um, and so it's time for us, right? Everyone that's in the legal system to, to be honest about that, right? To call it by its name and to begin with a process of grappling with, you know, transition and transformation. So just to follow up on that and also on Judge Weeks's point about, you know, being a catalyst for bringing change, for bringing fairness um, into, a system that is designed to be unfair. Uh, you know, we have seen this shape criminal justice outcomes, but I, I'm sort of, I'd like to move on to sort of discussing how, how you talk to communities and even your own families. I mean, one of the questions that I um, had sent earlier was, uh, you know, when Amy Coney Barrett, before she became a justice, she was asked in an interview, uh, what it's like for her kids to have two parents who are lawyers. And she said, you know, her kids find her, their father to be much cooler because her husband was a federal prosecutor and their sons were riveted by his stories about how daddy was putting the bad guys away. And now, of course, she's not the first person to express prosecutorial work that way. But we are in this, you know, new wave of DAs who are reimagining what it is like to be a prosecutor. And it's a role that adds a different kind of weight when speaking to communities, when speaking to youth. And so when so much of your work, whether it's being a judge or a prosecutor or a defense lawyer is not a dispassionate endeavor, but it occurs in a system that harms your own communities, harms your own families, how does that weight shape the responsibilities you take on in your individual and professional lives? So I really deeply despise that Amy Coney Barrett story. Um, and I deep, I despise it because it's so deeply racialized. Uh, you know, I have been a criminal defense attorney, you know, currently now prosecutor. 
And um, when, as a black lawyer, when I was a defense attorney, I was a good guy, right? Um, to a lot of to a lot of black people, right now I'm the bad guy, right? And even for me, when I was a criminal defense attorney, twenty years ago, if you had told me that I would ever be a prosecutor, I would have, you know, I try not because, because you know, I am trying to get to heaven one day, but. I, I might have cussed you out, right? Because I saw prosecutors and people who chose to be prosecutors as the worst type of people, right? They were inflexible. Uh, they may individually be like a good neighbor or somebody I wanted to, I might have a drink with later on afterwards, maybe. But in the courtroom, they... I saw them as people who ignored the truths of people's lives, you know, uh, to talk about the story that Henderson Hill, uh, you, know, you know, gave us about the young woman who literally has her infant ripped from her arms, right, because the law demands it. Um, I tell the story that if a prosecutor told me the sky was blue, I would have to get up and go outside and look for myself because I would feel like they had done something to the windows, right, to, to make it look blue. Right. So that that's how deeply certainly as a black person, as a defense uh, attorney, that's how deeply I distrusted the prosecution, uh, the criminal criminal prosecutors. Now, as a prosecutor, I have also come uh, to understand that the dirty little secret of the criminal justice system is that uh, not only are all of the defendants uh, black, all the victims are also black. And there are, you know, for, uh, you know, communities that are, have been kind of for the historical focus of law enforcement um, and for defendants who come out of those communities, uh, they're, you know, they, they have experienced real trauma, right? They have experienced real, uh, I mean, I see horrible things every day, right? I talked to uh, the families of every homicide victim um, when we when we have um, initiated charges against homicide defendants. I make it my point to talk to those families myself. Right when we offer pleas, I've had families tell me, uh, you know, they don't like the plea that I've offered. It shows that I don't care about the lives of young black men. Right, um, I've heard it all. So, but what I also know is, so it's, it, it's for those communities. It's not that they don't want policing, right? They want to feel safe too, right? They want it to be better, right? They want it to be more equitable. They want it to look like uh, what it should look like and not, uh, they want, like Christina said, they want you to call it what it is right now. And then they want you to move to change that, right? So how do we, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult sitting here as a black prosecutor, you know, it's kind of in vogue now to talk about progressive prosecution. Um, you know, people might get tired of seeing my face, but I will, you know, remind you, that of 2,200 elected prosecutors in the United States, uh, people who look like me still represent less than 2%. So, you know, in the words of Drake, now I'm hot, next time I'm not, right? So, you know, <laughs> um, you know, there's, this is still a, a, a system in which um, black people feel when they're defendants, they don't feel treated fairly, and when the victims, they don't feel treated fairly. Um, and so it, it's hard as a black person to sit there. So my kids don't think of me uh, as, as cool, right? I have, I have three teenage daughters. One's a freshman at the North Carolina Central University, Eagle Pride, everybody out there. Um, 
And one is a um, junior activist. And at some point she and I are gonna have to come to, um, we're, we're, gonna have a, we're gonna have to come to Jesus with each other, right? Because she sees what I do in systemic terms is immoral. Now she's, she's 16, you know, but, but she, she, regu she regularly talks to me about the criminal legal system and its impact on black people and how I participate in that. And, you know, I'm her mom and she loves me. Um, and one day I won't be buying her groceries and she'll have, you know, she'll be able to tell me exactly how she feels about what I do. Um, but again, to go back to what J Judge Week says, what I try to do in my office then is bring as much fairness and equity to what we do as is possible when 100% of the people you're dealing with are black. Like, it's not like I can say to the, uh, the law enforcement, hey, go out there and arrest people who aren't black so I can prosecute people who aren't black, right? I only essentially can prosecute what I have before me. And so, you know, and so what, what I try to do is, and what fairness and equity looks like to me is being more transparent, right? Talking about how we make the decisions we make, why we make the decisions we make, being really more transparent about um, what criminal justice looks like. Uh, you know, most Americans only have uh, interaction with the criminal legal system on television. They watch Special Victims Unit, they watch NCIS, and those are all homicides and robberies and rapes and arson. And less than 10% of my caseload is violent crime. But that's all anybody wants to talk to me about. Right? But the real opportunity is this 90% of stuff where if we're looking at it, where we're revoking the licenses of black and brown people, um, where we're uh, convicting people of drug and property crimes that have better resolution, that don't lead to collateral consequences. Um, you know, that, that's how I think we do it more fairly. So I probably took up too much time. But. Now, you know, the most powerful experience I had with a related conversation also happened in Durham. I was invited to talk to a group of middle school students this is 20 years ago. And since I was specializing in death penalty, I thought, well, that's an awkward conversation to have with uh, kids this young. So it turned into more conversation just about policing and you know, how we can get help to kids and children who need help. And we had discussions about uh, evictions and food insecurity and those sorts of things. After the class, the teacher took me to her closet and showed me a picture a gallery of last year's class, the students from last year. And she went through the life histories of all of those kids, uh, evictions, uh, transient moves within uh, the school district in, in Durham, uh, family members who were victims of crime, witnesses to crime, uh, uh, arrested for crimes. And yeah, you know, she told me, uh, Mr. Hill, you know, I'm convinced when these kids turn 18, half of them will be your clients. And you know, the challenge that we have is a system that doesn't recognize all of the ways in which our children, uh, our, our young adults are subjected to real trauma. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard when kids are moved five, six times in a year because uh, they're evicted multiple times in a year. It's hard when, they, when they're when they coming to school hungry and going home with no idea where the, when next they're going to eat. All of these create barriers to education. It creates fights in the school. It creates um, expulsions. And yeah, unless we've got a system that is responsive to the broad social net, uh, all of these microaggressions, all of these daily traumas are unrecognized and they compound day after day, year after year. Uh, and you know, so it's not only the question of what, 
you know, how do we address it when some 18, 19, 20 year old is charged with a violent crime? You know, what have we been doing for the 15 years before that? Uh, and that's why uh, when I hear cries for transformation, it's often in how do we recognize, um, you know, the, the true class of survivors of trauma. You know, they're not the necessarily the complaining witnesses, the witnesses under subpoena for things that are being litigated in court. Uh, our survivors are our neighbors. Our, our, our survivors are our family members who are going through these issues uh, with no real uh, backstop, no community backstop. And I did want to add, in light of what Ms. Deberry said regarding being the DA and prosecution and what Henderson Hill said regarding um, the trauma that a lot of young people face that often goes unnoticed. By the time they come in front of me in the court system, I think part of my job, my responsibility is not to re-traumatize these people, the young people, old people, all the same, because everyone has some experience that likely put them there, not by choice, just by their life circumstances. And so I take a huge responsibility once an individual comes in front of me and trying to understand not just the fact that they are in front of me for committing a crime, but how they got here. What was the life experience? What was their challenge? What was their barrier or obstacle? And then what can I do about it? And so I, I take huge ownership of that because that's the, the least I can do is try to meet them where they are, try to understand their perspective and then try to move it forward so they won't come back into the system knowing all these barriers exist. Um, for example, if I send someone to get substance abuse treatment because they're there for some kind of substance use disorder and I already know that the person is homeless, therefore I know they have no money to, to, to support that, then how do I address that problem? So then I have to work with probation and hopefully they're also trauma informed. It can help the person with transportation, help them into some kind of, um, living situation where they can work with the person on resources. But it's important that when someone has experienced trauma, as a lot of folks are who come before us, that we try to identify it, that the attorneys, defense counsel present that to us. So we know what we're working with. Everyone isn't the same. Everyone doesn't stand on equal footing. You know, so we have to have that information to be able to render what someone may be just or fair judgments to the extent that we can. But we have to have the information um, to make the person more productive and help them know that we do listen and we do want to work with them. And, do we, and we do know that everyone isn't the same. Everyone doesn't have the same experiences that place them in the judicial system. And so we have to come at it from a perspective of understanding, but also listening to that backdrop that Henderson spoke about. So can I, I wanna come at this sort of from a different perspective, sort of a more per personal perspective. I know that uh, myself and Henderson and Judge Weeks share the experience of having, I shouldn't say you didn't fight her, you presided Judge Weeks, but Henderson and I like stood, had the experience of standing in a, in a courtroom, right? And, and arguing for, um, for the recognition of, 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 of racial bias, like really, right, in a specific case. So in my, in my instance, Right, the case I argued in the United States Supreme Court, uh, my client was on death row because his own lawyers introduced an expert who testified that he was more likely to commit crimes in the future because he was black, period, hard stop. That was the only evidence of future dangerousness in the case. It is the thing upon which he was sentenced to death. This case went through all of the courts and we lost everywhere except the United States Supreme Court. But so when I argued that case, right, um, you know, I. I, I'm literally arguing the question of whether or not Dwayne Buck should be condemned to death because he and I, right, share the, uh, the, the fact, right, the, birth, the fact of birth that we are both Black people, right? I am as indicted and implicated in the outcome of this argument, you know, obviously not as, right, who's going to be executed, but I am fully right, implicated by um, the outcome of this case, right? I have, a, I have a 12, gonna be 13 year old daughter tomorrow, which is her birthday is tomorrow, you know? Um, so, I mean, it was, 
you know, it's a challenge, right? To stand in, a, in, in the well of, of the United States Supreme Court and demand recognition of what is ultimately my own humanity, right? To be called to ask for that, right? In a courtroom. Um, and, and then to, to prepare actually, and indeed, you know, if I was, uh, you know, deep, deep buried in my, in my back of my head, right? Expect a decision that didn't recognize it, right? Like that I was losing, right? Every other court I went to said, there is no constitutional error in this. Every other one, every single one, right? There was no constitutional violation here, right? And so I had to go into that argument, right? In the knowledge, right? That the Supreme Court could affirm the finding that there is no constitutional error in a jury condemning a man to death based on his race and the courts affirming, upholding and, and facilitating that execution. And then the consequence of that, like for me, right? As a black person, as a lawyer, right? As a person in this country, like what, you know, what do you even do with that reality? Um, you know, that's a challenge. And I will say on a funny note, so in the series of moots going through that, everybody kept telling me I had to fix my face because I had to screw face on the whole time, right? <laughs> because it was hard, right? It was hard not to be really personally angry about the case because it really was, you know, it was about me. It was about, you know, all of us here, all right? And our humanity. And that is a, you know, it's a, it's a different burden to carry. And I said, I, I, I don't know, uh, Judge Barry and Judge Williams as well, but I know Right, Judge Weeks and Henderson have stood in that space, and you understand sort of the, the challenge of of demanding right a recognition of of black humanity with you know for a client, uh, when in reality you're doing this you know what you're doing the same thing for yourself, and that is a thing. Yeah, the Racial Justice Act adds a slightly an additional dimension to that because you're advocating for your parents and friends and neighbors, everyone who gets a jury summons and thinks that, you know, you know this is their opportunity to carry one of the two most serious uh, obligations of citizenship. And you're gonna go into a courthouse that's going to look at you on one dimensional, one dimension and decide because of the color of your skin you shouldn't, cannot sit on this jury. And to see that happen over and over again in every county in the state, uh, that, there, that there is this accepted narrative that says if you're African-American, you're not as qualified, you're not adequate to make judgment on this most serious of, of criminal charges in the community. Uh, yeah, so it, it does energize you in a way uh, but it is also a, it's a secret tax on us as professionals, uh, because it shouldn't be that we've got to defend ourselves, our family, our community, and their right to full citizenship. But that's what we're called on to do. Uh, and it, it's frightening just in the current state. Uh, and I think, I, I, I keep getting drawn back to January 6th and seeing the difference in which uh, these rioters were, were received and are received uh, by a whole political party here. Uh, that, you know, our, our people, our concerns, our health, our safety is just not respected and viewed as fully human, fully American. And we are charged to advocate and defend uh, that fundamental position almost every time uh, we're in court or we're advocating the issues that we work on. You know, I've, I've heard the comments about trauma and in all candor, I had really not given a lot of thought uh, up until uh, the invitation to participate in uh, this discussion about another aspect of the trauma that I think all of us share. Uh, and I've been listening to what was said um, if the objective is to argue and advocate for fairness, and if you happen to be a person of color, part of the dimension of the trauma 
that I really hadn't come to acknowledge in my own life was the examples that were given about uh, the harm that's done by folks who look like us in our own communities. Uh, and being fair in that context as well, not ignoring that. You know, on a personal note, I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I grew up uh, in a neighborhood that would commonly be considered to be a hood. Uh, I've lost family members uh, to drugs. I've lost family members to violence. On one occasion when I was holding court in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, a young lady came before me on an extradition matter and kept looking at me and looking at my nameplate. Turned out she'd done time with one of my relatives. So I have that life experience that played into who I am and how I see things. Uh, and I've had instances where I've had senseless violence committed by folks who look like me or folks who look like us. Uh, and if the objective is fighting for fairness, that additional strain or context of, well, you have to be fair in all respects. Uh, you have to do what you believe to be right. You can't argue that others are unfair and then put yourself in a situation or a scenario where you can't, and it comes at a cost, say this is, these facts require that I do what I believe fair here as well. Um, in preparation, I pulled an article that uh, really blew my mind when I thought about the trauma that all of us, I think, have experienced to one degree or another at one level or another, and how it bears on our own personal lives. Now, I thought when I came to Fayetteville, North Carolina, that the practice of law was essentially what I saw every day. You got in the office at 8.15, 8 8.30 in the morning. Uh, depending on what your experience level was, was you worked district court, then went up to superior court. Our office had a practice that you second chaired on serious matters within one year. Uh, until you moved up. Uh, but after six o'clock at night, 6.30, three of the five lawyers in our office were always there. Every Saturday, every Sunday, a majority of the lawyers in our office were in the office. We had brief banks, motion banks. I thought that's what the practice of law was all about. When you compound the things that we've been talking about and how it impacts on us and what you bring into your home, that takes it to a whole nother level in my mind. And I am more mindful today of how that trauma, uh, the intersection of race, the intersection of secondary trauma, the intersection of uh, the emotional cost and toll that it takes on all of us. That's why I appreciate us having the opportunity to have this discussion because there is a cost. Uh, and I'm hopeful that this discussion will look uh, enable us to uh, take that cost into consideration in addition to all of the other heavyweight stuff that we're talking about uh, now as well. So we are getting inundated with a number of audience questions and um, I have to go to a couple of these. Uh, this one in particular is, it was being asked uh, and forwarded to me a couple of times. Um, it's a question from a professor and the professor asks, given the realities of working in a systemically racist system as a person of color, how do the panelists manage their own self-care? Well, um, <clears throat> I had, you know, just Judge Week set this up well. Um, you know, it's tough. I can be cold, I can be mean, I can be distracted. Um, and a lot of that has happened since I, you know, my mother used to tease me. She said she didn't know if I was born a lawyer or I just found whatever fit my personality to do for a living. But, um, you know, I've been practicing law now since 1994, which is over half my life. And it changes you. Like you're not, uh, you do see the world differently. I have a therapist that I meet with every week. Um, in addition to just being, in addition to being a, a lawyer, a prosecutor, the elected district attorney, a parent, black woman in America. <laughs> um, you know, I'm also the boss of other people, right? And so I make decisions 
um, every day that impact the well being of other people's lives. And, uh, you know, this job can continue, can tend to, uh, it's kind of popped me out of my friend group. I don't have uh, a ton of friends who um, either do what I do or recognize the stress of what I do. Um, and so I, I also have a, a chat that I participate in with other black women um, elected prosecutors. Sometimes that's a, uh, a, a very small group of people. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, you just have to take care of yourself. I used to exercise. I don't do so much of that anymore. Uh, but I think you have to be, it's, it, you have to be intentional about the ways in which you uh, take care of yourself. I don't know if any of you all knew Professor Jerome Cope, who is a um, professor of mine in law school, but my second year in law school, he told me that the, the law can be a jealous mistress. Now, beyond the kind of gendered, <laughs> gender issues around that, um, you know, that he, he said, you have to watch out for that. That's been good advice. I mean, it can take over your whole life. I was really the um, panel, the first panel this morning was really powerful. I want to thank those folks for, um, for being so open about that this this morning, I actually read that article um, about her husband in the New York Times when it happened, and uh, you know, recognize that in many colleagues. But you know, there's a there's there's a, a special weight that we take, um, and you know, I've seen lots of. I, I hold my breath whenever the bar when the uh, bar journal comes out, and it has this um, disciplines and disbarments in it because it used to just be uh, full of black lawyers, you know? And a lot of it has to do with just, you know, the, the stress of doing this work. I, I consider myself a survivor as a boomer because for most of my work career, I didn't have that kind of balance. And, you know, uh, I think I survived notwithstanding that because in each workplace, you developed friendships that were deep and meaningful. And yeah, I think both in the abolition community and the criminal defense community, uh, there are some very, very special people, not all of them lawyers. Uh, and, you know, many of them have been people that you've been able to share some of uh, the weight of the work that we do. And I think that's been uh, especially important. I think uh, the bars and the black bars slowly appreciating the need for this. For the last few years, I've, annual, I've attended the annual uh, program by LAPD. I'm sure I'm getting the initials wrong. But I think uh, the, uh, that part of the bar that focuses on microaggressions and the need for self-care I think is critically important. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, lawyers, and most especially uh, uh, black lawyers of younger generations are fully participating in that. I look back at my career and think that having a, a, a partner uh, uh, who was fully understanding and having two kids uh, who forced you uh, to spend time away from uh, these, um, these microaggressions and huge aggressions that you deal with in the court were important to stabilize uh, my life, but uh, we don't do enough. And uh, I think we do have to be more intentional uh, as a profession and as a community of advocates to understand uh, that uh, what uh, Christina sparked, you know, this is an assault on us every time we deal with and have to defend this aspect of our client's interest. And we need to recognize its impact on us. And uh, we've got to find community ways of, of, of carrying that burden. And I've seen where uh, it's heartbreaking, uh, where uh, partners uh, and colleagues don't have that support and the self-destruction 
can ruin lives and take lives. And that's just uh, painful in an unspeakable way. You know, the, the challenge I face being you know, a Superior Court judge is we have a lot of heavy cases that we deal with so far as individuals receiving heavy sentences, long sentences, extremely long sentences, life sentences, death penalty. And that's a huge burden. And Judge Weeks, I'm sure you, you understand what I'm saying about this. And so self-care is important because the way it works here in Mecklenburg during our criminal administrative weeks, we are paraded with a host of cases, back-to-back -back robberies, back-to-back -back sex offenses, back-to-back -back whatever it is. But by and large, it seems like a lot of the back-to-back -back violent crimes are people who look like me and people who I feel like I can relate to on some level when they start speaking. And it, it, it bothers me. And I carry that with me, not just as I sit on the bench, but when I leave the bench, I think about those people. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had three gentlemen, ages 17, 18, and 19, come out back to back. And each one of them got sentences for robberies of no prior records of less than 60 months each. And my heart wept for them. And by the time the third gentleman came out, young man, kid, boy, child that he was, I was heartbroken. And that was just, that was all before 11 o'clock that morning on one day. And so when I see those kinds of things come before me and I see the courtroom full of black and brown people and I wonder what is their story, what brought them here? And then what is my role? And how can I even help in this situation? That's a heavy burden to bear when I feel helpless a lot of times. And so when it comes to self-care, um, I do have a couple of sister circles, girlfriends who I talk with. I'm in Judge D. Berry's camp. I do need a therapist. I've been talking about it for years, but I haven't yet gone there. I'm a former treatment court judge. And so, you know, I've talked with counselors who work within the court system. And I see the benefits of having um, someone to talk to, someone to walk through some of the things that I struggle with, that we struggle with in the profession. Because what I've learned over the years is if you don't address it, you may start self-medicating in some form or fashion to deal with it in other ways, to try to just take yourself out of that level of anxiety that comes along with a lot of what we deal with, or even depression that comes along with a lot of what we deal with. And so for me, it's been very beneficial to have, um, we have 31 judges here in Mecklenburg County, 21 in, Superior, um, 21 in District Court, 10 in Superior Court. And so I have a lot of people here in Mecklenburg that I can talk to so far as on the bench. As a judge, we're so much isolated as to the number of people that we can't really talk to about things that go on in the courtroom. There's not a whole lot of relatability within the bar. It's mostly within the judicial um, division, if you will. And so there are a lot of the judges here, primarily African-American female judges here in Mecklenburg that I do talk to on a one-on-one -on -one basis or even in some group messages regarding what we're experiencing, how we're dealing with it. One of our judges, the longest serving judge in Mecklenburg County, Ricky McCoy Mitchell, always reminds me that self-care is important. You know, what are you doing to take your mind somewhere other than what you have to deal with in court today or what's going on in the future? And so the way that I've dealt with it is in um, leaning on my colleagues for support, my family, church, prayer changes things. It really does. Um, and so I've done that, but I think my sister circles have probably been the best thing for me, someone to talk to outside of a professional setting, if you will. I, I would just say that for, for me, I think I echo everything that everyone else has said, but I think that, um, you know, I have found it very important to have a universe that isn't this, right? That isn't this, right? That doesn't touch um, criminal justice and isn't tethered to criminal justice. So I have, um, you know, sort of my core friends who don't, they're not lawyers, they don't, they're, you know, they don't spend their time dealing with murders, they don't, you know, n did none of it, none of it. It is, you know, it is a world of, you know, parenting a 13 year old and, you know, like the, the other stuff of life. Um, and for me to have a space where I'm not, you know, in charge of a big organization like I, I, I feel your pain, uh, Mr. Barry, on that, right? And not in charge of a, a large organization, you know, not, you know, dealing with the challenges of litigating in court. It's just, you know, me at my most, you know, me, right? Not, not the professional me, just like the inside me, right? And I have a place where I can go and be that um, without all the pressure, without the expectation. 
And for me, that's a very, you know, a really important and precious space. So this is a heavy quote that I read from Brian Stevenson a long time ago that, that resonated from the moment I read it. And I just wanted to read it to you all. Um, he was interviewed uh, in The Guardian and he said, and I'm quoting here, he said, I don't do what I do because I have to. I do what I do because I am broken too. You cannot defend condemned people without being broken. You recognize this community of the broken. That makes it not about them, but about you. I'm trying to save my life. When they're executed, a part of me dies. When they're exonerated, I feel their freedom. What, I mean, and of course, Brian Stevenson is um, a long time, you know, capital defense uh, uh, lawyer and an advocate and his introspection is, is just, um, it's very compelling. I, I just wanted to ask what you make of this insight that he reflects on. Brian testified as an expert witness in the initial RJ hearing uh, that I had. Uh, and that was my first opportunity. I had colleagues uh, who would work with him or had been involved in programs with him, but it was my first opportunity to meet him. Um, he, uh, as part of his testimony, presented a study uh, dealing with uh, uh, appellate Batson decisions in southeastern part of our country. North Carolina then and now uh, has the reputation of being, if I recall correctly, the only state in that area that has never upheld a Batson challenge. Um, uh, and uh, there's some, if, if I'm wrong about that, Henderson, please let me know. But the only one that I'm aware of is they found on behalf of the prosecutors that a defense lawyer had violated Batson, but they never found that a prosecutor had. Uh, and I, I read much of his material. Uh, I share, wasn't able to articulate it until I heard it come from him. But when he said it, it hit home for me because I recognize that uh, part of my life experience, my professional experience uh, had brought me to the same conclusion. I'm broken as well. Uh, and I'm fighting uh, to do what I can, not just to unbreak other folks, but for myself as well. Uh, for me personally, I'm trying to move through the story of Black brokenness into a story of Black joy. Um, you know, I just had a moment of joy because I saw Justice uh, Sherry Beasley's face pop up in the top corner of my computer. <clears throat> and so I know she's out there. So I say hey to her, um, you know, serving under her as Chief Justice was one of the great honors of my life. So, um, but yeah, it's hard. You can't do this work unless you, you know, understand that <clears throat> trauma is, you know, to be a human being is to be traumatized. Um, and I recognize that you know, when I show up, uh, for many people, I am a reminder of the worst day of their lives. And I try to keep that in front of me um, and uh, in, in everything that I do in this work, um, and, you know, in the hopes that nobody has to, to do it again this way. Henderson, I can't tell if you're trying to turn your. No. Oh, something's going on. Okay. So we have six minutes left. I really don't want to leave with a heavy question, but all the questions that are coming in are pretty heavy. So here's the last one and maybe somebody can end us on a more hopeful note. Um, this is from an attendee. I am a black female attorney practicing in a rural Arizona county. I am the only black attorney in the county. 
I have faced countless microaggressions and instances of racial bias, mostly from the bench and from prosecutors. I tried to notice a judge for cause for racial bias and the pre uh, president judge's written response was littered with ignorance, mischaracterization of my arguments, conflating racial animus and racial bias, and frankly danced on the line of overt racism. I feel powerless and I have been prevented from responding so as not to quote, anger the bench. What can I do? I feel powerless. I've considered leaving the county, but then I let racism win and that is something I cannot do. For what it's worth, uh, I learned this lesson early on in my life. What don't kill you makes you stronger. Hang in there, do what you gotta do and stay steadfast to what you know is right. Yeah, I wrote an uh, answer to that question in the Q&A, and I'll just say quickly, um, <clears throat> you know, I feel for you, sis. That is a, a, a rough situation to be in. When I was a criminal defense attorney, I was the only Black woman prosecute, uh, the only Black woman practicing law in four counties. And I um, was defending a young man in a trial, and at the end of the trial, the judge delivered to me a 10 page poison pen letter in which he had, I assume rather than paying attention to what was going on in the trial, had spent time criticizing me, 10 page, 10 handwritten legal note pages, criticizing me, how I had failed my client uh, and how I had mis besmirched the profession, uh, the legal profession. Um, and, you know, I didn't do anything about that. And I still haven't, and uh, and I'll tell you why is because, you know, I, I tell people if my law my law license is all I got. If I'm not practicing law, I'm flipping burgers, um, and so you got to my law license is gold, and so you got to you got to weigh, uh, you know, the now plus the future. File it, write your notice, write down what happened, put it in a file in your office. Uh, karma comes around and one day, you know, he might, he might need you for something or he'll be in front of you for something and uh, you will have that. Uh, and so take that into, into how you, um, you know, keep that in mind as you make your decisions and just, and here's another thing, pay it forward. Don't ever do anybody that way. Right. Like to, you be the person I tell the young lawyers in my office all the time, you be the lawyer you want to be. You practice with integrity. You practice fairness. Let them deal with themselves. So I was just going to add, I, you know, I actually don't, I, I don't know that I think that you need to be a martyr to this, right? I don't think you're required to stay and suffer through um, a system that is I, is racist towards you. I don't think you should feel as if you know you have some obligation to subject yourself to that. I actually don't think that's right. Um, you have choices. Um, you can exercise them, and I don't think you should feel you know that that your you know that your choice is to stay and be mistreated or to be defeated and go, that's not right. You have the right to self-care. You have the right to be treated well. You have the right to make a choice to go to a place where you, you know, where you'll be respected and honored. And I don't think that's defeat. I think that's, um, you know, integrity and respecting yourself. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't accept, I guess, the, 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 the proposal that, that you have to stay and experience that. You don't have to stay and experience that. Um, you have choices. It's a big country and a lot of people would be appreciative of your work and your, and your commitment. Well, I think those are some very strong words to end on. So thank you so much to our very outstanding panelists. And thank you, especially to Mark Rabel and the Wake Forest Law students for your incredible work in putting this symposium together. I look forward to the next and final panel. Thank you. I just wanna take a moment to recognize uh, the profound reflections we just heard in that last panel. Um, 
if our seven 700 guests could give a roaring applause, I'm sure they would. Um, so it was such a such a privilege to end on that on on that note there um, with that panel.